Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unstructured Unlocked. I'm your host, Chris Wells, Vice President of Research and Development at Indico Data. And today I am joined by two very special guests, Tom Wild, CEO of Indico Data, and Madison May, uh, ML Architect and Co-Founder. Guys, how are you today? Hey, Chris, good to talk to you as always. Yeah, hey, Madison. Going great. Now, Tom, I got to ask, most people don't take these interviews from a discotheque. So what's going on in the background? <laughs> I am uh, reporting in here from uh, InsurTech Insight at the O2 in London, uh, a big event, about 5,000 people here, uh, all focused on the future of insurance. And obviously, you know, London being a, a critical uh, geography for the insurance market worldwide, you know, with the with, uh, London market and boy, um, so a very big event. That's exciting. Insurance seems to be like the flavor of the day. Um, is there a lot of energy there? A lot of energy. You know, I think that um, insurance perhaps gets a, a bad rap for uh, how much they want to transform their businesses. They're obviously businesses that have been around for a very long time. Um, but the energy around creating the next generation of of both, you know, the business itself, profit within the business, uh, the organization of these businesses to respond to, you know, what is definitely a changing landscape uh, out there in terms of, of risk and returns. Uh, yeah, the energy here is terrific. Excellent. Uh, today's episode is about all things GPT-3 and chat GPT, and I'm sure we're going to circle back to how that those uh, massive groundbreaking technologies are influencing these industries. But Let's start off with quick intros. So Madison, you're a co-founder. You get to go first. Um, tell us about your journey in this space. Of course. So I, I started at Indigo nearly eight and a half years ago now. Um, dropped out of college along with the other three co-founders in order to kind of see if we could make this dream a reality. Uh, Indigo has evolved quite a lot over time from the API company that we were in the very beginning. Um, but some things have always held constant. And our interest in generative, uh, generative AI and natural language processing is one of those things. Uh, it's been wild to see this technology and in industry mature and to kind of have to adapt uh, as academia and industry change what it means to work in natural language processing over the years. Yeah, eight and a half years has been an eternity in this space, right? Like, okay. You're one of the OGs. <laughs> Natural language processing was very different eight and a half years ago. Uh, we got started right when computer vision was having its AlexNet moment, back when computer vision was making great strides because of deep learning, and natural language processing was a little bit late to the party. So yep. uh, when we were getting started with Indico, it hadn't yet experienced that same explosion that AlexNet had provided for, for computer vision. So we got to ride that first wave, but it, it feels like we're uh, preparing to write another wave here as GPT-3 is uh, the model of the hour. Yeah, let's. I'm going to put a big pin in that one. We're going to come back to that. Tom, tell us about your journey with this company and uh, just technology in general. How did you get here? Yeah, I've been in the enterprise content technology space for the majority of my career. You know, what started out as, you know, the transformation that search itself brought to these markets, you know, really um, sparked by by Google, uh, and and then extending into enterprise use cases and the possibilities around understanding and accessing unstructured information in ways not previously possible. Um, this is sort of a carry forward of a personal interest of mine, you know, since that time. So my uh, involvement with Indico started with uh, meeting the founders at Indico, you know, seeing the very disruptive uh, innovation they developed in it in the way that we're able to understand and comprehend unstructured data in ways that, you know, were previously impossible, yet sort of another step function, uh, a disruption and, and innovation. Um, and what really struck me as, as fascinating was there was an opportunity to figure out what does the product look like? Who is the customer? What is the problem we're gonna solve? All the things you have to do when a, a start from a position of a technology innovation. So how to take that and turn it into a business. And uh, so I joined and we started down that path and it's been, you know, just it's a wildly fascinating and, and, and also a lot of fun. And 
especially now, uh, you know, you see a lot of the beginnings of Indico having uh, sort of come to life here in the market that we're all uh, we're all experiencing with ChatGPT, et cetera. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you, uh, not a loaded question. Do you ever think maybe Indico got there a little too early? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, uh, timing when you're building a young company is, is a big part of the equation. Uh, and I think we were very early, uh, then we were early and, you know, now the, the market has, has really arrived, I'd say in the last 18 months. And that's part of, you know, the startup journey is. You need to get the product right, the market right, the customer right, the messaging right. And that comes together when it comes together sometimes. And, you know, when we think back to the sort of way we articulated this in the early days, it was very much an enterprise AI pitch. And at the time, frankly, that was sort of the level of detail the enterprise was looking for. You know, they, if you recall, there were VPs of AI uh, at many insurance companies and banks. Um, in retrospect, it seems a little bit funny because that would sort of today being like, I'm the VP of Java, right? Like you wouldn't do that. You know, AI is a technology. It's not a solution. Um, and so that the, the market's journey is, is very similar to ours. And we find ourselves now having this incredible technology, incredible product and team and, and a, 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 you know, a market that is very, very interested in, in now taking advantage of these things to solve critical business problems. Yeah, the world seems ready, finally. It's exciting. Also, I hope all those VPs of AI are doing okay. I hope they landed all right. Um, uh, anyway, I think so. speaking of the market being ready, I'm going to kick it over to Madison. Why don't you help us understand, help the audience understand, what is GPT-3, three and a half, three whatever, and what's the difference between chat GPT and why does everyone care so much? So three questions in there. It might take a little while to unpack because I need uh, most of the episode for this, Chris. But uh, yeah, so in many ways, GPT-3 is not that different from technology available probably five or six years ago. So um, the earliest GPT uh, wasn't even called GPT at the time. It, it had some uh, not so memorable name. It was just kind of a, a long paper title. And the name was actually given to uh, the original model by some subsequent authors who had the site that work. Uh, it stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. And at its heart is something called a language model. Uh, I think it's useful to understand just the basics of the language model in order to kind of reason about how GB3 behaves and what tasks it's good at, what tasks it's not, what errors it's prone to. So language models, uh, it's just a fancy word for saying, predicting the next word in a sequence. So if you have a part of a sentence and you ask the model to fill in the next word with whatever it believes is most likely, you call that task language modeling. Um, and it turns out that training a model to perform that task well enables it to build a useful foundation on which you can build all sorts of interesting applications. Because learning to predict the next word in a sequence well requires quite a deep understanding of how English language works and requires solving many difficult kind of subtasks to solve that task well. So sometimes predicting the next word in a sentence, it's just a matter of uh, understanding that, oh, hey, we probably need uh, an adjective here or a noun here. It's kind of simplistic to, to get the early wins at that task. But later on, it's a matter of understanding that, oh, this pronoun refers to this proper noun over here. Maybe that's what's being referred to here. You know, maybe you need to evaluate some ethnical expression. You need to know some world knowledge, like what the capital of a particular country is to predict the next word in a sentence. Um, it's kind of the long tail of the task that a model needs to solve in order to solve this task well is, is quite interesting. And, and even the simple stuff, right? Like I'm going to the grocery store is more likely than guillotine, but given the broader context, um, either answer could be right. So learning that, that weighting of which word, um, even that is non-trivial, right? Absolutely. And language yeah. is very contextual. 
Very so much. often Very you need more than just a couple words of context to solve that well. Gotcha. So why is GPT-3 so good? What's the, what's the difference? Well, not much in terms of the ac actual model architecture. The general blueprint for the model is very similar to what it was five years ago with the initial GPT paper, but it's been scaled up by a factor of a thousand. And it turns out that factor of a thousand mattered quite a lot in terms of uh, the model's ability to solve practical problems. So this thing isn't going to run on my MacBook. That's what you're, that's what you're telling me. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's GPT-3. It's a language model. It looks and quacks like previous language models. It's got a lot more data and a lot bigger footprint, so to speak. So what's chat GPT and why, why am, why am I worried about my daughter using it to write term papers? Chat GPT is actually quite similar to the tech it's built on, which is GPT-3. You can kind of think of chat GPT as just uh, a sparkling version of GPT-3, you know? It's almost the same, but it, it has a little bit of extra training in order to make it more conversational, in order to make it a little bit less likely to hallucinate content, to produce profane content or content that you might not want uh, with factual inaccuracy. So just kind of making it more appropriate for use for real applications. And I, I think one of the things that folks miss out there in the wild, whether it's in the news media or LinkedIn, is that that extra layer of training to get that sparkling quality, that was actually human beings heavily involved, mm -hmm. right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. I, I think maybe the first thing to notice here is just that in this uh, language modeling task that we talked about previously, this model was trained on a, a significant portion of the internet. and. Uh, Learning to solve that task well is about learning to model the data on the internet well. And the data on the internet has varying quality. Some of it is excellent. Some of it is more like Yahoo Answers, where learning to model Yahoo Answers well doesn't make for a useful end product. It makes for hot garbage. Um, and in order to get something useful at the other end, you need to guide the model towards the uh, productive portion of the internet or productive kinds of responses, intelligent kinds of responses. And that's what this final bit of training is all about. Um, just steering the model in the right direction. I think what's really interesting about chat GPT that isn't widely understood to build on Madison's point is how important human in the loop as a concept is also to chat GPT. That there are several hundred people behind the scenes curating a lot of these responses, not in real time, uh, but offline, uh, because again, it still needs guardrails and it needs guidance to be useful. And I think that that's a critical concept embedded in, in most AI, right? Which is, um, you still need to provide guardrail or it risks being, uh, not useful or even worse, uh, than not useful. So I think that, uh, it, it's not quite magic. You know, th there are still a lot of, uh, controls that have to go into using these technologies to make them successful. Yeah, I think th this is, this has been just another hype cycle of like, ah, oh, the robots are coming for our jobs. And really, I think everything, everything I've seen, everything we've talked about internally has been like, this is just another tool in the toolkit. If anything, it's going to make jobs better. Um, when it, when the right guardrails are around it as you're, as you're making that point. So I think I put what, what yeah, chat GPT is. Sorry, Chris. I think what ChatGPT has really done is provide a very sort of democratic access and exposure to these remarkable technologies that just wasn't there before, right? The average person couldn't really experience generative AI technologies yeah. prior. And what ChatGPT has done is provide a consumer interface to that and, and let people play with it, right? And, and initially there was just you know, of course, wild excitement and awe that now you see some of the news stories where uh, some of the, the drawbacks or weaknesses are. So it, it's good. It's a natural progression. But that to me is, is what uh, GPT has provided was this sort of profound uh, consumer exposure to these remarkable technologies that didn't exist until ChatGPT arrived. No, that's right. Uh, previously, the most experienced 
you know, the average person had with AI was Siri or their Google assistant, which as we know, right. is not a great experience, right? No Very offense to Siri. Yeah. All right. I put a big pin in a topic, which I want to circle back to now, because I think it's timely in this conversation. There is a lot of, and this question is aimed at both of you. Um, you know, just a year ago, maybe two to two years ago, even there was a lot of talk of, are we heading into the next AI winter? Um, and now we find ourselves, Madison used the language of riding, you know, getting ready to ride this big wave of GPT-3, artificial intelligence. So what is that wave going to look like? And um, what do you think it is about these technologies that's captured the imagination of all folks, folks in the enterprise who are really curious about this and just the average person? Like, why is this wave cresting so high? Madison, why don't you go first? Sounds good. And I guess I should lead off by saying, I don't want to present an overly optimistic view of the technology because like any technology, it has its flaws, yep. but it does have some pretty major strengths. One of the things that I think is most revolutionary about ChatGPT is simply its ability to put machine learning technology in the hands of the consumer. You don't necessarily need a data science background in order to interact with it, in order to get it to do useful things for you. Uh, just the ability to speak natural language, the ability to speak English is all you need to, to get started. And it also has some key strengths over traditional data science that are appealing. Um, namely, it's very, very easy to rapidly prototype and to iterate on an initial design because with traditional machine learning, iteration requires essentially making model architecture changes, making changes to your data set. There's kind of a couple factors that that slow you down if you want to change your mind about how you frame some business problem as a machine learning solution. With GPT-3, that just requires changing the content, uh, changing how you interact with it by asking a slightly different question, refining some of your criteria for what a good response looks like. It's just a much quicker feedback loop and short feedback loops drive massive productivity. And I think as from my perspective, you know, the, what's been so profound, uh, you know, it, it, about Indico's development, uh, as well as the industry is our focus on using context and Madison uses work, our focus on using context to determine meaning is really profound and that it freed us from the brittleness and constraints of trying to teach the machine with instructions, which is software to teaching the machine by example, right? Which really depends on context. And that to me has is, is been what's most profound about all of these developments that teach by example has unlocked the ability for much less technical folks to allow the machine to do ever increasingly complex topics. I think what GTT3 has shown us with this a thousand X increase in, in the size of the model is just how complex language is, especially the context of language. And it also shows you how powerful human communication is, right? All of that context is embedded in how we speak to each other without even knowing. That's been historically very difficult to translate to a machine's understanding of context. And this has really been a profound, you know, a jump in that understanding, GPT-3 in particular, um, which unlocks, you know, even more robust use cases. So I think that's part of the reason for the excitement, you know, is that suddenly become quite tangible. Yeah, it's an interesting point you make, Tom. I think you're, you're talking about the progression from if you know from you to from Madison to you is, you know, to start off with, you have to know how to write TensorFlow code to get good answers out of these models, and then you have to know how to label a document the correct way. And now it, you know, with these models, it's like you have to. This is like the Oracle at Delphi. You you have to ask the question in the right way to get a reasonable answer. Um, so it's interesting the transfer of those skill sets, and I. You know, looking at you, Madison, you spent so much time in your life figuring out how to really architect models well and all of this stuff. Is there any mourning that's going on as, as you think about the way that the, you know, the sort of onus has shifted from the back end engineer to, uh, you know, the person just writing a prompt? Not at all. And part of that is, is because it comes with its fair share of weaknesses, which I'm sure we'll discuss later. We will. Um, Moving from building data sets to writing prompts means that 
you don't get the same quantitative metrics that you typically get when working on a machine learning project. And there are a couple other related drawbacks too that just make it mean that you have to put together an additional process to make sure that you can trust the outputs of GPT-3 as much as you can trust the outputs of a traditional, maybe transfer learning based machine learning system. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to circle back to that hard. I want to, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the history of Indico. Madison, you mentioned that generative AI has been something that's been part of the DNA of this company for a long time. Um, so I'm going to kick that over to Tom and why don't, why don't you give us a little history lesson? We'll kick up our feet by the fire. Yeah. The, the, the sort of the origin story. And this yeah. has become, you know, even more fun now than ever. Now that we'll, this little broader markets have the context to see, um, you know, why these, uh, initiatives and developments that we undertook, you know, six, seven years ago were so important and have become so impactful. Um, you know, going back to the very beginning, the Indico founder, um, Madison, Slater Victoroff, Alec Radford, uh, you know, these were, I, I still think of uh, the, the, and Luke Metz, you know, these were generational talents, our generational talents in the field of, of natural language processing. Alec, in fact, wrote uh, what I think today is still one of the most cited papers um, in this category uh, called DC GAMS, and then went on to uh, do a lot of the research and writing around the original GPT and then GPT-2, but now even GPT-3. So Indico has been using these technologies, you know, let's include generative and declarative type uh, uh, of technologies to, to understand on structure since the very beginning. I think, you know, if we kind of fast forward there, what makes us unique is we've built this incredibly powerful framework that allows the enterprise to take advantage of these technologies without having to do all of the tremendously hard work that goes with training, deploying, explaining, governing, right? Those are all things that are really all part of the, the problem statement. It's not enough just to build a model. Um, it is how you will actually use and experience that. And if you look at our origin story, with each new uh, development in the market, GPC, GPT-2, Bert to Roberta, um, we are very, very good at understanding what those developments are really skilled at, what they're, what they're good uh, to point at, um, refactoring, them so that they can be used in the enterprise. In fact, our product can be completely deployed inside the enterprise firewall, including, you know, the Indico large language model. Uh, so from a security standpoint, you know, that's a very important consideration. And now GPT-3, which has some very specific strengths and weaknesses, which we'll talk about here in a bit. Um, how do we allow the enterprise to take advantage of those strengths, not be risked by the weaknesses? Of, and so that's kind of the, the origin story of Indico is this in, uh, for us, uh, very much business as usual, right? We're, we're, we, we always look for that next uh, uh, evolution of the technology, factor it, make it part of our solution, allow the enterprise to succeed with it. Our yeah, that's in his own. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, just just going to kind of expand upon that. Our policy has always been that you should be skeptical of any startup that claims some singular technical advantage. Our philosophy has always been that in the machine learning space, we're blessed that the communities really embrace open source as published work that would, in other industries, possibly be kept private for years and years. And really, the key skill set needs to be productive in the machine learning industry is recognizing when the advances from academia and the giants like Google, Facebook, Microsoft are worth actually productizing and when it's kind of incremental improvement over the norm. So I remember in some ways at times, I, I, I think about at times as it's almost more akin to a commercial open source uh, for our, in that, you know, we provide the framework, the training, the deployment, the management of it. You know, it, it's not exactly a perfect analogy, but there's definitely some parallels there for sure. Sorry, I'm the stuff I No, 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 that's fine. I, I was just going to pull that thread a little bit further and ask, you know, we've all worked with open source projects. We all know they have pitfalls and. To your point, we're very thankful that they exist, especially in the ML community. But what do you see as being the biggest gaps? And I'm going to focus this question in a second on GPT-3. What do you see as being the biggest gaps typically between 
someone releases the weights and biases of their model with maybe some training scripts and getting that into the hands of, say, a knowledge worker at an insurance company to help them with broker intake. What is that productization um, process? What is it usually fixing in these contexts? And Madison, you want to go first? Of course. So part of what we do is we try and make these models as efficient as possible, as cheap as possible to host. Often there's not as much emphasis on that in academia. So yeah. that word often falls to the industry. So this means looking at things like speed ups from reduced floating point precision or just speed ups from the way we apply the technology to our problem. There was a lot of art uh, required there. I wouldn't say that it tends to be one or two singular big things. It tends to be hundreds of tiny details that need to be done correctly in order to get optimal performance. Yeah, and those, yeah, those tiny that... details, sorry, Tom, I was just going to say, having been an academic, those tiny details are not the kinds of things that end up in publications, right? So you really have to be an expert um, to get under the hood and find them and fix them. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. Uh, yeah, I think from the very beginning, we had a philosophy that we really wanted a, you know, I, I like to say that we've built our product for the business, but our technology for the enterprise. Meaning, you know, we wanted to put in enough guardrail and, and help a business user succeed with these technology, avoid, you know, some of the common traps uh, and, and pitfalls. Um, but not uh, reduce the power of it so much that it was no longer useful. That's a real art, you know, and that's using the word art. That's the art in this space is, is that that very careful navigating of those two poles uh, to deliver an enterprise-worthy application, but one that also doesn't require, you know, extraordinarily uh, uh, technical or skilled people uh, to, to deploy and operate it. Because not because those people aren't important to the, the use case, but because there simply aren't enough of them, you know, within the enterprise uh, to do this, you know, at scale, cost effectively, et cetera. Yeah, that, and that is an excellent segue into the next section. I swear we didn't rehearse this. Um, I want to talk about hype versus reality. So what's ready to go in the GPT-3 space for the enterprise? And what isn't quite ready for prime time? What are some of those pitfalls and, and what's really working already? Maybe before we talk about what's ready to go, we should talk about some of the weaknesses. Yeah, the model. let's do it. Just to, uh, so for one, there's no guarantee that models like GPT-3 aren't going to make content up. There's now, why, why is that, Matt? Why is that, Matt? It's kind of an artifact of the entire field of generative AI. Uh, it's with great flexibility uh, comes great responsibility. <laughs> And generative AI has this capacity to write any text. With a lot of the traditional machine learning technology, we're solving a much more constrained problem. So we're, we're doing something like applying a label to the words in a document or classifying a document into one of 10 categories. There's no real choice for our model other than to put that document into one of 10 buckets. In the case of GPT-3, the model can produce any English word. And because it can produce any English word, sometimes the words it produces are grounded in the document that you're interested in. But sometimes the words it produces are just simply likely words for whatever reason. So I believe so, if you, uh, maybe to make this more concrete, yeah. I think one of the examples shown in one of the early releases of Bing Chat was uh, a question like asking Bing Chat to provide restaurant recommendations in a particular area. And if you read through the brief recommendations it provided, many of those restaurants have this string, no reviews for this location yet. And if you actually go and look up those businesses on Google or Bing, you'll find that they had thousands of reviews. Yeah, but because there were just loads of of businesses that did have no reviews, the model emitted that string simply because it was likely. Because there are a lot of cases where there were no reviews present for a business. W would you say this is the language equivalent of like you know an image generation platform creating like crazy seven eight fingered hands? Is that is that kind of what's going on here? 
certainly similar. Yeah. If you squint hard enough, it's a hand. If you squint hard enough, it's a reasonable restaurant review, right? Exactly. Yeah, I think okay. part of this is, you know, this is a, a technology in some ways behaving like a teenager, right? It, it, it's much too confident in, in its understanding of the world, which, you know, teenagers all, often fall into this category, uh, primarily because they don't yet have enough experience. But that doesn't prevent them from believing, uh, you know, they have the experience the, to perform a certain task or have an opinion about something. That's very much what ChatGPT behaves like. If you ask it a question, it will give you an answer. Yeah. Um, whether you know it, it actually has the standing to provide such answer, and that's where this sort of hallucination sometimes come into play. Uh, you know, where you don't have the ability to really understand how confident it is, or or what basis it has for giving you that answer. But its opinion is, well, you asked, so I'm going to tell you the whole. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's trained to answer, right? That's its whole shtick. It's trained to um, answer. All right. So we're hallucinating, confident lying, big pitfall. What's next on the list? Let's keep marching through this. Boss is certainly a big one. GP3 is probably 10x more expensive or more than the task-specific models that we deployed in Indigo. 10x is probably a dramatic underestimate. Wow. All right. So it won't. As, as I joked earlier, it won't fit on my laptop. In fact, it won't even fit on a single you know, compute note, right? It's not fitting in a, a single um, processor. So you have to have a really specialized skill set. Not only is it expensive, but even if you wanted to run it on your own, the, the you development can. ops, like, you know, it's a really specialized skill set to get this thing to run. Do you see that cost coming down? Yes, I think there's still some low-hanging fruit to be reaped in this space. So maybe we can expect a three X change in cost. We're not going to see dramatic reduction in cost in the near future. Tom, do you, you know, you, you talk to the folks that would, uh, that would have opinions on this more than I do. Do you think this cost is going to pass muster in the enterprise? How's, how's this going to work? I don't think so. Um, it, and I think there's a little bit of a, a Moore's law in reverse here with machine learning that I've noticed which is, you know, Moore's law that told you that, Hey, don't worry. In eighteen months, you know, GPT three will will be in cost wise. I don't think that's true. I think that um, it's sort of like the engine manufacturers figuring out how to build a thousand horsepower engine, but now they want to build a ten thousand horsepower engine, right? So the cost one is like come down. The performance will go way up, but I think the cost won't. It, it that's not really how machine learning seems to be operating. Unlike say, you know, uh, a computer performance historically. Um, I don't think that GPT-3 is, is viable for large-scale enterprise use cases right now. I think it's going to have to be deployed for very specific uh, uh, pieces of the, of the challenge, but not the whole challenge itself. You can't, you know, some of our customers process billions of items a year uh, with Indico's platform. The math for that, uh, in terms of the cost they would take for GPT-3 to do that, does not justify the performance increase, right? So um, part of what vendors like Indico will have to be good at is carefully selecting when to use technologies like GPT-3, also guard railing them uh, because there's other issues, you know, for example, you have to use sort of a web type uh, uh, integration with it, which means there are other That's only. security issues. That's only. Um, so if you want to find the firewall, you can't have it. Um, so all those things will make enterprise adoption a challenge. And you know, that's why the years of experience we have with adopting these kind of technologies, I think, puts us in a really good position. Yeah. I wanted to touch on something that you said there, Tom. I think you kind of implied that GP3 is always going to be more performant in terms of quality for a given problem. I also don't think that's true in general. GPT3 tends to be a jack-of-all-trades, master-of-none kind of model. It's very good at getting you to good enough. It is not necessarily the best at getting you to production quality. And the reason for this is simply that it there's a trade-off between breadth and depth. And many companies have very specific problems. They have very specific processes. And you need to be very descriptive about exactly what you want in order to get the correct behavior. Mm. You can only be so descriptive. I'll trust to that, you know, 
it's fantastic in straight line acceleration, but you know, don't try to turn it, right? And, and, yeah, yeah, right. Some of the analogies there would be, for example, it doesn't have an understanding of the layout of the thing that it's been similar, right. right? It only understands the tech. And in enterprise use cases, the layout is a vital signal uh, to help understand the aboutness of, of that, that piece of data question if we're talking about documents specifically. So to build on Madison's point, um, this sort of master of none is, is a challenge when in the enterprise, the specificity, accuracy, these things matter critically because of the kind of decisions that uh, they are they are powering, right? Uh, in terms of an insurance, should I underwrite this risk? Should I approve this claim in lending? Should I, you know, lend this money uh, in healthcare? You know, what is this diagnosis? These have a level of uh, impact in terms of accuracy or mistakes that is far, far higher than, say, a consumer-based uh, application or deployment of this technology. Interesting. So circling back to the the question of how do you productize something like this? With, you know, with other models, we've found sort of where the potholes are and we've hit the landmines. What's the path to productizing GPT-3? Is there one or is it, you know, sort of a cute, it's going to get a lot of enterprise buyers excited about AI and that might get us into conversations, but is there, is there really any meat on the bone here? Certainly. I think you just need to play to the model strength. So I don't think it's an appropriate fit for many of the use cases that Indico tackles day in, day out. Its greatest strength is that speed of iteration, that, that time to value aspects, we're able to get up and running and get to a good enough solution, like be split. And making use of GPT-3, I think it's going to be a lot about making use of that particular strength. Okay. Tom, how about I you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the dream in machine learning is always been, you know, quote unquote, zero shot learning, right? That, that it just knows before I even ask it. And I think GPT-3 brings us a lot closer to, to a zero shot, you know, understanding uh, of content. Um, that has pretty profound implications for how we initially train and build models in a very positive way. Um, because you can start to, you know, understand how to, to build a training theft each model very, very quickly to learn about the point about, uh, you know, speed to impact and, and the ability to then iterate from that quickly. Um, so I think that's very profound. Um, you know, I think that what we're working on is how to, how to then take that uh, sort of initial traction that you get from GPT-3, but still make it cost-effective to use at scale. So, you know, that, that's a lot of the, the interesting work to be done here as, as one example. Yeah, so to my knowledge, Indico is the first platform out there that, you know, put transfer learning in the hands of the people who actually know how to read documents. And that was built on Roberta, the first couple GPTs. Um, it right. sounds like what you're saying is there's a path to using GPT-3 to do some of the easy parts of that transfer learning, like label the stuff that it can, let the human worry about the hard cases. Um, and to your point, that's the straight line acceleration, right? GPT-3 just has to be GPT-3 and then you, know, you take over right. the wheel afterwards. Yeah, that's the way to think about it. And I think that, you know, we always promote the bionic arm as the right metaphor here. Um, a lot of people want to use kind of robots and brains as the metaphor. And it's just not appropriate. It's not accurate. It's not the wrong expectation. I think it also vastly underestimates, you know, just how powerful the human brain is. We're very, very far from, from that. That said, you know, we believe the bionic arm is the right metaphor because putting experts uh, at the middle, um, allowing them to do more, faster, better, more accurately, more efficiently, uh, that has very uh, positive and dramatic uh, ROI for the enterprise, um, but also has the appropriate, you know, guard, I've used the word guard wrench quite a bit, you know, the human loop has to be that guardrail to make sure that um, the, the quality of, of these ultimate decisions uh, is appropriate. Yeah. It's also not as cool of an analogy. Robots are much less cool than mech suits, right? So <laughs> right. let's, let's move on. Through. Um, all right. So, Tom, you talk about one of the strengths being, you know, sort of playing off of Madison. One of the strengths is the zero shot capabilities. 
it will answer questions that it's never seen before. And often it's, it's pretty good as long as you know how to, to sift out the stuff that isn't quite there. Madison, what, what other strengths do you see that this big model has that others before it didn't have? That's a good question. Um, for one, I think it's applicable to a larger set of use cases than previous models. Previous models, we talked about this classification framing, we're assigning a document to one of 10 buckets. Yeah. Or assigning a word in a document to one of 10 buckets based on its function. Like, is this a, a company name or a price, something like that? Uh, those are very constrained problems. You know exactly what you're going to get out the other end, but you're kind of limited to assigning labels to things. Yeah. On the other hand, Generative AI, it's, it's, it's greatest weakness is its greatest strength. And uh, it's not restricted to just adding metadata, to whatever you provide, it can produce new content. Uh, you know, you can ask it to write a, uh, article about insurance in the style of Shakespeare and get a reasonable result at the other end. Uh, that's something that's simply not possible with the traditional machine learning paradigm of assigning labels to things. Uh, the knack is in finding the right applications for that technology. Summarization tends to do quite well. That's kind of a killer app for generative AI, natural language summarization of like a longer document. Uh, another application might be search followed by natural language question answering. So if you have a large corpus of documents, folks narrow that large corpus down to a smaller number of, of relevant documents and then ask GPT-3 to answer a question based on that context. Yeah, like That's what's the difference between these two, right? Exactly. Or yeah, yeah. that too. Um, so I guess the set of problems that is applicable to is simply much broader than what we're used to dealing with. And it's going to take a little bit of creative thinking in order to figure out how we can leverage that for practical business benefit. Um, I think, uh, Chris, to build on your your um, comment about uh, your daughter writing birth papers in chat, you can see, I, I put a comment about LinkedIn last week and I said, you know, rather than saying students should use chat GPT, let's ask them or let's require that they show their prompt. Uh, because in many ways, prompts are the new coding language. And I think that's going to be true within the enterprise as well, that the the skill required to quote unquote write good prompt uh, will be sort of the next generation of, of software coding. And you know, writing good prompts and, and, and also helping enterprise users write good prompts uh, and use them to get the information they need even more quickly, more robustly than they could before. That's a profound change and very, very compelling and exciting um, but we're at the very, very beginning of it. Yeah, I remember old, old man story incoming. I remember back to when Google came out, right? You were talking about the advent of Google style search and that was a sea change from like aol keywords like purely faceted index search right and i had it's friends only who, right and Boolean. Boolean. yeah yeah i had i had friends who just could not use google adequately like they couldn't yeah. figure out how to, how to write the search query in a way to get back the things that they cared about and i think this skill that is emerging in terms of prompt engineering is just that on steroids right I remember the original search nerd at the beginning uh, of the search, uh, search wave, uh, same experience, right? That true information scientist absolutely rejected uh, the Google style search and said, you'll, it'll never surpass bully, right? Bully yeah. and is still the only way to search information correctly. Um, and this is a kind of a moment like that, I think. It also might change the skills that we value. So by virtue of having such great generative AI, we need to become better discriminators. We need to get better at recognizing, uh, based on our own intuition, our own judgment, when an output is trustworthy yeah. and when it really needs to be fact checked, when, when we need to be a little bit more skeptical. So I think it's going to be interesting to just see people improve with that skill of discriminating between what is Flower, flowery but empty and what is actually genuinely insightful from GPT-3. Yeah, no, this is like, 
Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. I was going to say, and going back to, you know, another weakness of, of chat GPT right now is its lack of explainability, right? And uh, the enterprise has to have explainability as part and parcel to uh, any AI-based solution, something that, you know, again, we were first to market with explainability for uh, AI model, you know, targeting vector data. Um, if you think about governance and compliance, if an AI says, yes, you should underwrite this risk, and you say, why? And it says, I don't know, I just think you should. I mean, that's obviously not acceptable, and I'd be limb, but that is the equivalency, right? That, totally. okay, you need to explain your decision to me so I can understand it, and I can also, by the way, shoot it, because maybe your understanding is still not quite where it needs to be. So explainability um, is vital to, to using these technologies in the enterprise. And again, some of the things we're working on is like, how do we bridge the gap between the lack of explainable that we can use free um, and the explainability we built into our, our product experience um, so that it can be used, but used, for lack of a better word, safer, right? Yeah. No, the, uh, the fintech guy in me has crippling anxiety at the thought of trying to explain the data lineage of decision that GPT-3 exactly. was involved in, right? Like, yeah. That's a big bridge, uh, and I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly how to build it. Um, so, circling in on the industry, Tom, since you're at the insurance discotheque, um, what's the buzz there? Yeah. Like, what's the mood? What are people worried about? Um, what do they see as opportunities in the insurance space specifically? There's a, a very large trend right now in major carriers reimagining their, for lack of a better term, their workbenches. Right. Mm -hmm. So claims workbench, policy admin workbench, underwriting workbench. And think of a workbench as the orchestration of all of the upstream data uh, and the downstream decision. Yep. Um, you know, I've always had a, a kind of a personal opinion that if you want to distill what insurance companies are actually really good at, it's, it's making a specific set of decisions, right? Underwriting risk, approving claims, et cetera, et cetera. To do that well, um, they know now that data is the vital ingredient. And they've made huge investments in these decision systems or platforms. But what they realized is the source data is often very ugly. It is scanned PDF, the body of an email, you know, information designed for human consumption, not designed for machine consumption. And so, you know, the the power of the solution we built is that translation layer, you know, we take information really designed for human consumption and translate it to machine consumption. Now creating this superpower for your decision engines to operate on a, a much vaster set of data that, than they could before. Yeah, I've, I've seen this light bulb appear over so many heads over the years where it's like we automated something or partially automated something and oh my God, our data is so clean now. <laughs> We could actually use it downstream for things, um, right? Beyond just the process itself. So, how is you know how is the GPT stack playing into that? Is it just sort of raising the level of excitement? Do people have specific thoughts about how it figures into the insurance industry, or is is it too late or too early to determine that? It's it's definitely being discussed a lot uh, okay. right now at the show as well. Uh, nobody knows for sure, you know, exactly what the killer use cases are yet. I think the, the, the level of interest is very high as we often see if we're plotting this, you know, on the typical Gartner, uh, hype cycle, right. We're, we're on the incline, uh, in, in terms of the enthusiasm, we haven't hit the, uh, the, the peak of interest or even begun, uh, uh, into the trough of disillusionment, uh, <laughs> that no doubt is, uh, is ahead of us, like all new technologies, that's okay. Um, that's where we learn how to, to, to really uh, create value from these innovations. But very much we're on the, the upward slope of, of the hype cycle uh, right now with good reason, right? I think the, there's a lot to be hyped about. I love insurance folks. I have lots of friends in the insurance industry, but they tend to be fairly conservative people. So you've talked about the hype and the excitement. What are they worried about, Tom? Well, I think they're realistic that Things like explainability and governance, you know, are a bad, um, you know, for sure in terms of the, the conservativeness, because when you think about it, you know, the, this is an industry 
where there are hundreds of billions of dollars at risk. Uh, and getting that wrong, you know, can be catastrophic. So there's a good reason for that conservatism that that you find in the internet. But I think there's a, a very strong embrace of the need to keep uh, being able to take advantage of more and more data, uh, better and better decision uh, to drive the business forward, and a real understanding that that is a, a survival imperative. You know, it's not something that they want exclusively, it's something that they need. Interesting. All right. I want to, I want to wrap this with, uh, you know, put two questions on the T one for each of you. Um, Madison haven't heard from you in a sec. So as you think about your peers out there, ML architects, engineers in, in large companies like the insurance companies that Tom's talking to this week, how should they be getting ready, um, to deploy solutions that are built on top of these models, whether it's our platform or another platform? What can they do to get ready to get educated to remove roadblocks for themselves? Good question. For one, I think we need to be careful not to be enticed by the simplicity of the interface to GPT-3 and skip some of the best practices that data science uh, teams are good at. Um, GPT-3 doesn't require that you necessarily build out a labeled training data set in order to train the model, in order to measure the model's performance. But we sure as heck should be still going through that same process of producing quantitative metrics of how well the model's performing prior to putting something in production. It's going to be tempting not to, because it's no longer strictly required as a portion of the, the model development process when you're building content, building models based on GPT-3, but it's still super valuable. Um, so I think maybe just study a little, uh, making sure we're cautious about how we deploy this new technology and we don't circumvent some of the best practices that we now have the option to. Interesting. So stick to your guns, stay rigorous. Just keep going. All the hype. Yeah. Not like okay. the bullying guys, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Don't go down in the firefight, but yeah, I get it. Um, and then Tom to you for the enterprise buyer out there, who's got some mandate from their CEO to like, get me some AI. I need some of that AI. Um, how should they be thinking about this? How can they remove roadblocks for themselves? Um, one in terms of not buying the wrong thing and two in terms of how to evaluate the right thing. Yeah. I, th I think the, the normal human reaction here is, wow, look at this new hammer. It's like diamond encrusted. You know, I can, uh, where, where can I go find some good nails to hit with this new hammer? Uh, and I, I think that's, it's natural, but it's not very useful. So I think yeah. what's more important is, and what we really try to drive with our customer data is tell me about the outcome that's going to have a business impact that you desire. Talk to me about the outcome. Don't talk to me about the approach. Don't talk to me about the method, technology, or tool. Talk to me about the outcome first. And then let's work backwards to figure out which technologies and tools to use when. Now, that said, you also have to have enough imagination to look at it and say, what was previously not possible may now be possible. So I think we can help with that as a, as a provider in this space. And I think the customers can help by understanding the strengths and weaknesses of these technologies to say, hey, previously this was not possible. Is it possible then? And, and but still be very rigorous about understanding the outcome you're trying to craft um, as opposed to the approach or method. Uh, because a lot of times that will lead, lead you down the wrong, the wrong road. Yeah. yeah. That's great. They should get educated, I think is what I hear you saying. Maybe they should be listening to Unstructured Unlock, for example. It's a good starting point. Yeah. And on that note, I will yeah. bid our audience adieu. This has been another episode of Unstructured Unlocked. I'm your humble host, Chris Wells. My esteemed guests this morning have been CEO of Indico Data, Tom Wild, and principal ML architect and co-founder of Indico Data, Madison May. It's been a pleasure, fellas. Thank you guys for having us, Chris. You're welcome. Best of luck out there.